at the outset, let me express my sincere thanks to Air Marshal Matisse Varun and the Peninsula Foundation and the Women's Christian College for giving me this great privilege and honor to chair the fourth academic session at this international conference. Uh, the theme of the conference is international collaboration and global commons. Uh, I don't want to take much of the time which has been allotted for the panelists. We have three distinguished panelists, uh, two of them from the Navy, Indian Navy, and another from the uh, reputed institute which has a basic focus on international relations. The first speaker is Dr. Subha Chandran, who will be speaking on cultural legacies and competing for zones of influence, India, China and external powers. The second speaker will be Rera Biral Yes Stikande um, on international institutions, SROCs, choke points, freedom of navigation, and the last presenter is Vera K. Swaminathan, India's ability to provide net security and balance global public goods. Their institutional affiliations as well as their brief bio sketch has been already distributed to us. Just, I would like to say a small uh, a quote from Albert uh, Mahan, the great American strategic thinker, who wrote more than a century ago, uh, whoever controls the Indian Ocean dominates Asia. The ocean is the key to the seven oceans. In the 21st century, destiny of the world will be decided on its water. With this quote, let me request uh, Dr. Subhash Chandran to present his paper. We'll give 15 to 20 minutes and uh, after the three presentations, we'll have a discussion. Uh, I'm planning to do it in, in two parts. One, trying to identify who are the actors in this region and how are they trying to influence one sector. And the other sector, how India can respond to that, what could be a strategy for India. Uh, so let me start with this. Two questions. Who are the actors and how are they trying to influence? Uh, uh, you know, we yesterday we talked extensively about uh, China. Uh, so China is one major actor in this region that we are talking about. Obviously, US is another major actor. Uh, since we talked about elephants, I think I should introduce some of the other animals also. Uh, one is the camel. Uh, Saudi Arabia, you know, we, we kind of tend to ignore the role that Saudi, Saudi Arabia is playing or wanting to play in the entire Southeast Asia, especially in, in, in religious terms. I'll come back to this, but this is one important area where we also have a larger space to play and where uh, the camel is playing role. The other animal is the kangaroo. Uh, Australians are extremely tied up with, with Southeast Asia. In fact, uh, the next to the Chinese, uh, 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 Chinese students in Australia, I think Southeast Asian should, should form the largest chunk among the student group along with the South Asians. So Australia is also a major actor in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Southeast Asia. The third issue that we may also want to keep, besides looking at the countries, I think we have to look into the radical ideologies proposed by the Islamic State and the Al-Qaeda. Uh, do they have a, a presence or do they, have, do they want to have a presence? I think we should have to keep in mind it's just not the state actors, there are non-state actors as well. When I talk about non-state actors, I think we have to come with the, with the multiple uh, business houses at the international level. Yesterday, I think today morning, uh, Ambassador uh, Raghavan was talking about uh, the cricket team. Uh, you, know, you know, the cricket jersey that uh, the Indian team was wearing, I think we were looking at the wrong, the orange color. I think we should have looked at what was about India. I'm sure you would remember uh, what was about India, Oppo. You know, so I think we should have worried more about <laughs> that role than the orange role uh, of, of the jersey. That shows the power and the influence of, of international brands and then what they are trying to do. So let's not look only from the state actors, let's look at from the economic actors and the non-state actors. So that's my first point. These are the actors, US, China, Saudi Arabia, uh, Australia and the non-state actors, you know, uh, 
both the economic and, uh, and, and the radical elements. But how are they trying to influence? That's my second question. How are they trying to influence? One is the political influence. The Americans have been trying to use uh, the rebalancing, pivoting. Uh, now the latest one in the Indo-Pacific. They are using uh, political uh, slogans, political approach to try to influence, and then they, they follow up with with with, a, with with multiple agenda to achieve that. That's one. The military influence, you know, sale of equipments, weapons, you know, that's one influence. The third influence is the economic influence. This is where you know we have been talking about how China is using the Belt and Road Initiative. It started with the Maritime Silk Route. Uh, it's now talking about the Polar Silk Route. I am sure in the next couple of years it will come with a space silk route or a technology silk route. Huawei is, is the perfect example of how they are trying to use Huawei and the 5G technology to win over Southeast Asia and, and perhaps other regions. And they are working very well in East Europe. You know, the, the, the biggest debate in Germany and UK is should we go with Chinese 5G or some other 5G? You know, the, the past reality for us is uh, the Huawei phone is much cheaper than the, uh, the one that I am carrying. Uh, with me. Uh, so the technology, the 5G technology and how Chinese are going to use it, you know, one of the, you know, I, I don't see the trade war between US and China as a trade war. It's, it's who would control the technology. I think Huawei is a, is a, is a real issue or technology is a real issue and trade war is only a kind of an expression of that. So the economic influence, uh, especially the Chinese economic influence. Now you may ask, you know, everyone tries to do, everyone tries to do, influence countries with, with their economic presence. Why are we worried about China? At least three factors that we have to keep in mind. Why we should be worried about the Chinese economic influence. They just don't use in economic influence uh, uh, and leave it at that. You know, I'll give you three examples. Uh, what happened in Sri Lanka and what's likely to happen in Sri Lanka when they're doing the next election. They try to use their economic influence to gain political presence. Rajapaksa in, in Sri Lanka is the best example. Uh, last month, uh, last week, I'm sure you would have heard about it. There was an American citizen uh, of Tibetan origin came to Nepal. Uh, in, they, he didn't even enter Nepal. You know, the computers in the immigration uh, office said, you know, because his name sounded so close to one of the Tibetan official, he was asked not to enter Nepal. He was asked to go back. Uh, the Dalai Lama birthday last last month, you know, the celebrations in, in, in Nepal was cancelled. So use your economic presence to uh, to make political influence. The other important issue is the educational influence. You know, I'm sure you would have come across. Uh, let's not worry about the small Sri Lankans and the small Nepalis. Look at what Sydney University did, or the University of California did when, when there was an invitation to invite Dalai Lama, or, or you know how. Uh, the, the Chinese responded to it. You know, finally the Sydney University has to uh, withdraw their invitation to Dalai Lama. Uh, how also they use their economic cloud to come into their own, your own media. I was told there are at least 30 FM stations in US is under uh, the Chinese support or uh, the Chinese influence. In Nepal, at least one major newspaper carry, I think it's either Tuesday or Thursday, a strong China daily as a supplement. In fact, the supplement is bigger than the original paper. So is the case in, in, in Pakistan. The news every Tuesday carries China daily a bigger supplement. Uh, so, you know, it's it just not the economic presence. It's or how they use the economic influence to influence other areas. That's what we have to be worried about. Uh, and then this last big, big, big project. You know, yesterday I think Jamin was talking about uh, some of the Chinese big projects. You know, uh, the Colombo Port City project or uh, the the building the parliament in, in, in Kathmandu or there's the big projects in Tamil area after the earthquake. You know, you just go there. Sometimes you worry, you wonder whether you are in China or in, or in Kathmandu. That's the level of the China need and the Chinese presence. So it's just not the economic investment, but how they use that economic influence to, to come to, to influence other actors and other peoples. Uh, so this is one part that I want to discuss, you know, on who are the actors and how they try to influence. So I, I focus more on China, but then there are also other actors, as I as I mentioned. Now let's let me go to the second part. What can India do? Uh, I would like to propose. You know, there is this. We have been looking east, so look east as a slogan, uh, and then later we come up with this act east as a slogan. I think we should now look for a uh, bring east uh, instead of looking east and going to east. I think we have to bring east to us. 
India should be the center of. Uh, yesterday, uh, uh, ma'am, she was talking about uh, how in Indonesia, Malaysia, they say instead of West, Bharat as the West. We should not be the West. We should be the center of this region. And how we make this as a as this a center? I, I propose the following. Okay? The way we look at the regions. You know, yesterday, uh, Commander Ulebastar was talking about if you look at India from South, how will it look? Uh, if we look at the physical geography and the neighbors uh, of India, I'm sure you will come up with the SAR nations as the neighborhood. Yeah? But if you look at the maritime neighborhood, then it will start from South Africa to Australia. Uh, if, it, if you go beyond and if you look at the civilizational neighbors, then it will cover all the way from Mongolia to China to Persia. So it's, it's how we look at ourselves and, and place ourselves. So this bring East, uh, that's where I start with. And then I'll, I'll, I'll present a set of six or seven points on how we can achieve bringing. Before going into it, I think we should take a fact check uh, on whether we'll be able to bring the East to India. A, uh, uh, first fact check is we don't have the deep pockets the way Chinese have. So we will not be able to match Chinese uh, penny by penny, uh, project by project. I think if, if, if we have any grand design of matching Chinese uh, point by point, I think we are uh, we will not be able to do it. So that's 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 a no-go area for us. The second one is, will we be able to match with some of the other countries in delivering military supplies to Southeast Asia? I doubt that. You know, the Vietnamese may want uh, uh, some of the missile system that we have taken from uh, the Russians. Will we be able to? The Vietnamese may, may be wanting some of the aircraft carriers. Will we be able to deliver them or, or will we deliver a sensitive area? Uh, or whether we are capable of delivering it. You know, the two helicopters in Kathmandu handled from HAL will tell you a different story. You know, it's our political courage or uh, courage is a very strong word. Our political, uh, how do I put it? Whether we want to do it politically and whether we have the capability to do it uh, military in terms of military support. That's a second factor. Uh, the third factor uh, also has to be uh, in, in terms of identifying areas and uh, be with them for a long time. You know, in the morning we were discussing about our delivery, uh, uh, our delivery uh, systems, whether we, we over promise and underperform. So these are all the factors. After, after saying this, uh, is there a way for us? Uh, again, five or six points. Number one, I think I liked what uh, Professor Bajpai said yesterday when he was talking about regions. He started with the strategic uh, from, a, from a strategic perspective and a political perspective and then he talked about regions as cultural. I think that's where we should pitch in. Uh, that should be our primary project. You know, we should see uh, this region as a cultural uh, region and look at it as, you know, we are trying to, uh, you know, with all respect to one of my panelists in, the, in this uh, panel and also somebody who spoke on uh, yesterday on uh, India being a net security provider. I think we should look at India as a net cultural provider in the Indian Ocean we will never be able to provide security in the Indian Ocean. If, if you have a grand design, I think, you know, let us do it. Uh, but I think we can do much better with the cultural, uh, India being a net, net cultural provider much at a relatively easier cost. My question also is, when India became big in Southeast Asia and Indian Ocean, it didn't big, become big only with, with a security push. It, it became with a, with a cultural push. So that's one, India should, there should be a net cultural provider in, in the Indian Ocean if you want to bring East to India. Uh, that's the most important one. In this, I think yesterday we talked about political non-alignment. That's a conscious decision we made politically to be non-aligned. I think in the process we also made culturally non-aligned. We also made us, uh, ourselves culturally non-aligned. I think we should go ahead and make ourselves culturally aligned. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I think we have to reactivate uh, some of the stories that we have been telling yesterday, there was so much of an emphasis on Ramayana. We start with Ayodhya. There is Buddhaya, there is Ajmer. These are two other civilizations that started from here. You know, Ajmer for, for a Muslim civilization and Buddhaya for the Buddhist civilization which, which is spread all over Southeast Asia. Let's not just end talking about Ramayana alone. Let's talk about a Buddhist past, let's talk about a Islamic past. It, in this, it's, it's very important. It is not Saudi Arabia or West Asia from where Islam went to Southeast Asia. I think 
I can dare say, it went from us. Uh, I think we should we should be the narrative in Southeast Asia when it comes to Islam and not Baha'u. Sufi should be the narrative. I mean, that's where I, I strongly counter. I think we should get them here, not to uh, West Asia. I think there is enough in, in, in our past, you know, uh, in, to prove how Islam went to Southeast Asia. So, Ajmeen, I'm, you know, I'm just using it because I agree, Ajmeen, don't take it in, in, a, in, a, in a literal sense. Using as how these three civilizations have an origin in, in our part of the world. The second set of towns that I would want to talk to you is uh, Nalanda, Aligarh, and Kanchipur. Uh, we, as a seat of educational learning uh, in, in, in the past, uh, I think there were, there were enough proofs to, to tell you how we, we got people from, from, uh, from, from these regions to come and study with us. Today, you look at where they are going. Uh, you know, the Southeast Asia. They go to Australia, they go to US. Uh, I don't think uh, many Southeast Asians are coming to India to, to study. <coughs> this reason is simple. You know, we are not in the top 500 educational institutions. We are not there in the top 100 think tanks. We are not there as, you know, look at Singapore, Australia and China. And how Singapore and Australia has come up in, in this. They have bigger educational institutions, uh, bigger think tanks. You know, uh, the, the top 100 think tanks, you know, let's, let's not worry about how they decide the top 100 think tanks. But then, uh, you just take the ranking and then see where we figure and where Southeast Asia is. You know? so, so, we as an educational center. So, that's a third thing that we have to look at. The fourth thing that we may want to look at is outside Delhi. Uh, when we look about the push to Southeast Asia, let's not just use Delhi. Yesterday, I think Padmaja was talking about the Kalinga and the Satvahana tradition and somebody else was talking about the Chola tradition. Let's go all the way up to Assam and Naga traditions. You know, each of them have their own cultural influences. When we talk about bringing them, let's not bring them only to Delhi, let's bring them to, to other areas. So let's talk about our Chola traditions, Kalinga traditions, Satvahana traditions and the, and the Naga traditions in, in really, uh, bringing East uh, uh, to India. And then the fifth point, is let's just not talk about only Ramayana and history. Let's talk about the present. Uh, you know, the India today is not the India of the 40s. You know, uh, I take, since I come from Bangalore, I take the case of Israel. Yeah? Uh, last month, uh, Sri Lanka launched Ravana Mall. Yeah? Uh, it was built by the Americans and launched by the Americans. Last year, Bangladeshis launched Bangabandhu 2, uh, built by the no, Sri Lankans, the Sri Lankan satellite was launched, built by the Japanese and launched by the Americans. Bangladeshi satellite was built and launched by the uh, Americans. I'm sure we could have built and launched at one fourth of the cost. I think when we talk about making India, I think we have to talk in terms of launching India as well. Uh, so that is one major area. Let's, let's use our science and technology to attract uh, attract people, especially in, in this area. And this is something that's, that is doable. Uh, the last set of uh, issues while well, I am talking about educational institutions uh, also is, you know, just in front of us there is Shankar Neitralay and here and, uh, you know, on the other side of the post there is the schemes in Toronto. Uh, these two could be a, an attraction of, I am not talking about so medical tourism, that's, that, that's a different story. You know, how these institutions uh, can be the source of new invitations to this region. So, Besides talking about Tirupavai, Tirunampavai and, and other stuff, let's also talk about the modern India, the new India and how new India can attract uh, the, the in, uh, Indian Ocean uh, you know, to, to our food. I, I, it's not that I'm against using uh, the, 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 the history, let's use that, but let's also use uh, the, new, uh, the, 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 the new power that we have in, in science and technology the new uh, soft uh, projections that we have in terms of uh, our own institutions and then bring, uh, bring uh, these uh, people to, to us. So we will be able to do it, uh, you know. Uh, I think, just two minutes, just two minutes. Yeah. Will we be able to do it? I, you know, we, we instead of spending too much on military and uh, strategy or along with instead let me not put it in mind instead. I think these are doable areas. Yeah. Let me conclude with two points. As I told you, we may not be able to match the Chinese pocket by pocket, uh, uh, no, uh, point by point, project by project. Let the Chinese go for their pockets. Yeah. Uh, let's go for their heart. 
uh, you know, we, we will try to win them, uh, win their mind, hearts and their minds. You know, Professor Gandhi is uh, here in front of them. You know, Professor Gandhi is in Singapore. Professor C. Raja Mohan is in Singapore. I wish we have Professor Titanen from uh, from uh, Thailand is here with us in leading one of the institutions. <coughs> we get uh, the scholars just for a two days conference and then they go back. Yeah. So I think we should be able to get them and absorb them for a, for a longer period and make them as our ambassadors. Uh, I end with a personal note. Uh, I'm a great Rajni fan, you know, the 80s guy. Uh, I watched uh, uh, the Robo one, the old one, on day one. It's not a big thing though. It's not a big thing. I watched on day first. And I watched Robo one uh, after having dosa in hotel Saranagora. Big thing, and I, people can watch uh, dosa. But I watched Rajinikanth movie on first day after having dosa in Saranagaran in Bay Area of California. You see the reach. Unless we get, I am sure you would have seen this beautiful mission from Indonesia or Malaysia. I think Malaysia. Unless we make the Malaysians watch mission and take it to the more, more Korean or more Korean that they eat. Or this, this other famous Indonesian actor, like Satpura, Satpura, Nikki Satpura, I think, Saputra, and take them to an Indonesian cuisine here. I think that the, the pride that we have in, in our people have reached Bay Area and able to watch Rajnya movie on day one. I think we should be able to uh, get the Southeast Asians or other countries to come here and, 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 and enjoy their uh, their cuisine, uh, their, their heroes and their heroines. That should be our reach. Let's talk about Ramayana. Let's also talk about mission. I rest my case there. Thank you. I uh, you know, want, to, want to begin by uh, showing the opening lines of the preamble to the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, signed at the very scenic Montego Bay in Jamaica on 10 December 1982, which describes It, it described rather well uh, the enshrined hopes before it became as it became law that is promoted by the desire to settle in a spirit of mutual understanding and cooperation all issues related to the law of the sea and aware of the historic significance of this convention as an important contribution to the maintenance of peace, justice and progress for all of the world. I have a few slides on that and they will be left behind as pointers for some of the, uh, if you want to do any further study. The track of the eventual signing was marked by rock shores, choppy seas, cross currents, unfavorable tides, storms and even if not gales uh, and some very astute and cunning skippers of statecraft sent by many states during the several years preceding negotiation and stemming from the rather unfortunate 1958 convention. As always happens, perhaps needs to happen, the stand many delegations took depended on where they used to sit sat at that time or wanted to sit sometime in the future. There were deep differences between established powers, wannabe powers, if I may use the term, and smaller states. There was also some visionaries over the years who understood well the intertwined facets of national interest, interdependence, the common heritage of mankind, the problems and the need for some rights of transit for landlocked states and the very idea of freedom of the seas. We must give credit to the way in which some nations stood their ground on many issues but then yielded gently until some compromise could be reached on individual issues. Today we hear comments by scholars and strategists about the rule of law, good order at sea, freedom of navigation and reiterated often by heads of government when they meet. A bit of history is perhaps necessary but I will dip into it after pointing out three more points from the preamble to the UNCLOS 1982. And here is uh, one, one such, recognizing the desirability of establishing through this convention with due regard for the sovereignty of all states, a legal order for the seas and oceans which will facilitate international communication and will promote the peaceful uses of the sea and oceans, the equitable and efficient utilization of their resources, the conservation of living resources and the study, protection, preservation of the marine environment. I mean, there's a lot there. 
Second, believing that the codification and progressive development of the law of the sea achieved in this convention will contribute to the strengthening of peace, security, cooperation and friendly relations amongst all nations with the conformity, with the, in conformity with the principles of justice and equal rights and will promote the economic and social advancement of all peoples of the world in accordance with the purpose and principles of the UN in the Charter. The points I am trying to suggest here are first that there is a goodness of purpose here and you know the third point of the, one, one of the other paragraphs of the preamble uh, which states that the seas beyond natural jurisdiction are quote the common heritage of mankind the exploration and exploitation of which shall be carried out for the benefit of mankind as a whole irrespective of the geographical location of states. Second, there is respect for sovereignty and the urging of a legal order. Third, it was one of the first such conventions that looked at preserving and protecting 70% of the earth which is the surface of the oceans. When per, at perhaps at a time when even London smogs were, you know, if I may use the wrong term fresh uh, in, the, in the minds of Londoners, um, you know, uh, and global warming was a term used very quietly by some scientists and climatologists. Fourth, it became the foundational convention for follow-on discussions and agreements that would govern the other commons like space and cyberspace and some people mentioned it yesterday. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to show the seven dimensions of the Indian Ocean region in seven maps. First, the humanitarian dimension, tragically outlining the very spread of the Indian Ocean from the eastern edge uh, when, the, when the deep sea earthquake of the set of the tsunami right up to the western end of the Indian Ocean on the you know east coast of Africa. Here we are in Chennai where in December 2004, I don't have to remind you, tsunami, the tsunami caused so many uh, uh, deaths. The second is of course the political map in which real people in real countries, some not even touching the Indian Ocean, live in peace, tension and conflict. The IOR is primarily and ultimately about the land and people, not the sea. Uh, but of course the sea matters and which is the third dimension, which is the maritime dimension and the picture you see is of the Indian Navy's International Fusion Center IOR which is in Gurugram or Gurgaon, shared with me on 14 June 2019. Uh, the date has no significance at all. It was merely a grab day they sent me on that day. It's a very, very normal day in the Indian Ocean. Uh, the UNCLOS very much influences trade, security and prosperity while trying to ensure safe navigation, protect the environment and respect sovereignty. I won't belabor the obvious choke points as it has been referred to by a few speakers already. Fourth is the air domain. Here is the picture of air routes. The air we breathe exists in a rather busy and crowded airspace and these are only commercial routes. The entire ocean information exchange systems have gaps uh, and we know that in recent years, aircraft can disappear without trace and that hundreds of search sorties could not help find Malaysian Airlines 370 that went missing on 8 March 2014. Closer home, the Indian Air Force lost an AN-32 aircraft launched from Chennai over the Bay of Bengal to Port Blair uh, three years ago on 22nd July 2016. Searches for both included the maritime surface and underwater oceans. Uh, our underwater domains and the world realized the limits of its awareness. UNCLOS of course relates to some aspects of air traffic regulations as well in the formulation and work and has worked closely with the ICAO. The fifth dimension is the space dimension. The Indian Ocean region is vital for the space domain for commerce, peace and security because space too is an area from which threats could emerge and from which we need to secure and protect our own interests. This is the other common of our times that Mahan couldn't possibly have mentioned. The sixth dimension is yet another common and that of the cyberspace. Many of you may be aware that 98% of global cyber traffic is via cables and most of these cables are under sea. Uh, the net and the network is growing. UNCLOS has regulations about these. Cables are also a security concern for any nation as the new vulnerabilities can be exploited. There are now global concerns about China's capability to disrupt these underwater. But there is a seven domain and you once again see a map of the Indian Ocean. What, you, what we do not see here, ladies and gentlemen, is the submarines that we do not see. 
there is a there are an increasing number of navies that own and operate submarines in the indian ocean and they will continue to do so there are others outside the region who deploy their boats frequently their capabilities mission versatility lethality of modern submarines make them the most deployable and deadliest weapon in many aspects of naval warfare across the missions of sea control sea denial and power projection future trends are for long range small size unmanned autonomous vehicles which would leverage underwater domain awareness artificial intelligence quantum sciences modern materials and be a menace or provide security depending on who have them and who don't except in certain cases unclos is not an inhibiting factor for submarines and that this underwater domain is something that the indian ocean region will progressively get more interested in and therefore this map shows you the multi dimensions historically while the understanding of the freedom of seas and navigation existed in asia and the arab world in ancient times it is now commonly accepted that its articulation was done by hugo de groot or hugo grotius Uh, in 1609, in an anonymously published book, Mare Liberum, or literally meaning freedom of the seas, but it had a subtitle which said, uh, you know, uh, we can't have the Portuguese in Indonesia. Uh, but as has often happened before in scholarly opinion and official position, the stand one takes depends on where one sits. Grotius's liberalism was motivated to prevent the Portuguese, whose Vasco da Gama epoch was well underway in the 16th and 17th century. from blocking dutch hunger for trading in spices in what is now indonesia the 1494 treaty of tordesillas dictated by the pope four years before vasco da gama made landfall in calicut had drawn a line that divided the world quite neatly into spanish and portuguese hemispheres the dividing line on the other side of the globe of course passed through indonesia so indonesia you know the indonesian people who were a very cohesive set of people at that time uh, Had had the quandary: uh, Who are our primary enemies, the Portuguese or the Spanish, or both? The British, whose prowess at sea was rising, and where who were establishing more than a foothold in North America, were also pushing for freedom of the seas, a freedom that wanted to sweep away the opposition. They extrapolated John Selden's idea of mare clausum, that is, close sea, sometime in the 1620s and 30s when it was enunciated, a uh, closer home, of course, to protect fishing. and created sea room for themselves slowly in newer seas and on newer coasts in competition with other european maritime powers gaining influence over land was always a very strong urge in maritime empires that's what empires do sea power provided that leverage and was not an end in itself as britain became more powerful relative to others it championed freedom of the seas with even greater vigor uh, during the decades several decades of pax britannica After the Second World War, it was the United States, which had become by far the largest sea power by a great margin, actually started supporting the push from smaller states like Malta for what became contiguous zones and expanded into EEZs. It gave a new impetus to the negotiations and to applying pressure on nations which were already excessively claiming wide territorial seas and economic rights. Anyway, the UNCLOS 1982 actually codified several things. In a, and in a curious twist, the U.S. became a consistent advocate of the UNCLOS, even it, when it remains unratified by the U.S. Congress. Today, we hear of freedom of navigation mainly in the context of China's claims in the South and East China seas. China is in clear violation in some places, in partial violation in some others, and perhaps not wrong in some cases. It is the cumulative nature of these claims and the way in which the combination of these claims in terms of islands. low tide marks reefs and man made structures could be leveraged for a short for a sort of mare clausum a close sea when required out uh, out of what is merely mare liberum today unclos is rather clear on these issues even when nations that violate it or regulate beyond its stipulations try to justify their own laws of actions under the very same clauses which actually prevent it unclos 1982 frequently mentions freedoms related to the high seas navigation and transits the us navy's long tradition of engaging in what they call freedom of navigation operations is due to their resolve that they do not recognize any deviations from the letter of the stipulations of the unclos thus they have long engaged in forms in indian waters to name ourselves 
The U.S. consistently objected to Taiwanese claim on prior reporting of Philippines for claiming archipelagic waters for Australia on, uh, on insisting for mandatory pilotage uh, in the Torres Straits. Uh, and, and these are just a few examples, there are more. It is spawn of vis-a-vis -vis China that is most frequent as well as significant. In the annual DOD report, and you can read, uh, read the definition there, uh, you know, which describes what, what form ops is. There are a few, you know, examples here of what is meant by freedom of navigation operations plus innocent passage, which means you, you know, you, you go through territorial waters, you can, you can lower your boats and, and violate the precepts of, you know, uh, innocent passage by, by going through territory. T territorial claims that you dispute by going closer than 12 nautical miles, you are saying you don't recognize this. Uh, there is another, another example here. What happened in the mischief reef? Yes. So a few quick points could be made. It is debatable whether form of nudges anyone to modify their positions on UNCLOS or to the specific steps that are being objected to. The US and the US Navy have implied encouragement from others to conduct uh, uh, form-ops in the South China Sea. No other Navy is engaged in form-ops with them, although discussions are on for such a possibility. Most navies, in fact, sail outside the 12 nautical mile uh, li line of these claims and, in fact, actually tacitly recognizing Chinese territory and, you know, territorial claims. Since 1991, the US has conducted form-ops with, with, with respect to 60 nations. A few like Russia, Indonesia, I mentioned Taiwan already, but even Sweden and others have changed their positions on reporting insistence due to the sustained pressure. Despite many inconsistencies in US foreign policy, the essence of foreign ops has remained steady even if its practice has varied. Perhaps the US cannot step back. In future, Arctic use, Canadian claims and Russian claims amongst others could drive near-term insistence on doing foreign ops. There are of course escalatory risks in foreign ops versus China, but just as there are limits to US outcomes, it can be argued that the limits of Chinese counter-muscling are also evident. A few more words about slops. As I mentioned, UNCLOS has a huge influence on merchant vessel traffic. It is fairly regulated actually and disturbances today are few. Maritime states have enhanced safety through navigational aids, traffic separation schemes, contribution to search and rescue, pollution safety, etc. A few points. Currently, shipping traffic is not being impeded in the South China Sea and East China Sea in any particular way. In the IOR itself, disturbances to Indian shipping, uh, international shipping lanes have mainly been due to piracy and secondarily due to political tension in the Gulf of Aden and Persian slash Arabian Gulf, whatever term people prefer. There are serving Navy participants here and I would like to suggest that in our doctrines, we review calling piracy as a non-traditional threat. It is in fact one of the most traditional threats that navies have faced, nations have faced and navies have countered. Uh, I myself am guilty, I was part of the uh, a team that wrote the uh, 2015 book and, and I, I realized that you know this doesn't make, make sense, it is actually very much a traditional threat but that's a suggestion. Future amendments to UNCLOS and regulations for prevention of collisions at sea would need to consider unmanned vehicles impact of AI, liability issues and so on. Finally, a bit on archipelagic sea lanes and choke points. Many of the world's choke points are bordered by more than one state. This makes some aspects of navigational and safety security administration difficult, but states must, must find answers to these issues. It also makes dom domination by one side a bit more difficult. The positive arrangements in the Malacca Strait, the open regime of the Suez Canal for a few decades now, and the good archipelagic sea lanes arrangement by Indonesia were all led by both the letter and the spirit of Angus. And the ability and need to dominate choke points has been covered enough, I won't belabor that. The history of statecraft and of sea power that potentially impacts on the sea have and will remain important. And the history of statecraft and of sea power tend to underscore that with growing maritime power, the desire and ability to want and perhaps to enforce freedom of the seas actually grows. With some exceptions, growing maritime powers want deeper adherence to the spirit of UNCLOS, their own contrary urges notwithstanding. Even China could insist on some of these as it jockeys for influence in the Arctic and elsewhere in the world. In closing, I would like to leave behind three points. 
The first is that UNCLOS has actually created a beneficial, long-lasting scheme that has of international governance that has and could continue to assist mutually acceptable and beneficial uses of the sea, including those areas which are now the common heritage of mankind. The second is that UNCLOS has become the basis for resolving other global governance issues or regulatory issues depending on the term we prefer for other domains like space and cyber. The third is in that in statecraft, diplom diplomat diplomacy or military, uh, hard power matters even for freedom of the seas. As Emeritus Professor of International Law at JNU, Dr. R.P. Anand had pointed out when arguing, when arguments were being made for British primacy at sea, Selden won this protracted battle not by the brilliance of his arguments but by the louder language of the British name. Now we can add other instruments that help SEPA, including diplomacy itself. A simpler formulation that applies to well beyond the maritime domain and the lives of seamen is, he who rules the waves can more easily wave the rules. Or in Hindi, jiski lati uski bhais, and pardon me for any any uh, problems in you know the Tamil pronunciation, but I am told it, it could be translated as well in my ilam saritam. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, geographically, India, like it's been uh, shown several times and it's been spoken several times, uh, straddles the Indian Ocean region and therefore uh, geographically and uh, in terms of our location, we, we dominate the Indian Ocean. Uh, but naval practitioners like me like to believe that uh, it is in the Indian Ocean region that most of our problems lie. You know, our, our problems, our opportunities, our, our competitive advantages, uh, our risks uh, for, the, for the present and the future, they all of them lie. And therefore, we all look at the Indian Ocean region as, as you know, um, a space in which uh, we not only need to pursue all our national interests and aspirations, but uh, it's also a place that we need to uh, deploy all our elements of national power very, very intelligently. Uh, it's, it's also more important uh, because uh, this ocean space uh, has been contested, like a lot of eminent speakers before me have said. Uh, it is going to get increasingly contested, um, uh, and our own abilities uh, to challenge any contestation in this uh, are somewhat limited. And therefore, uh, if we've got to make a statement and follow our own aspirations uh, and our own national interests in the Indian Ocean region, then of course, you know, uh, we need to have a whole of government, a whole of nation kind of approach. But more importantly, I think we need to uh, deploy all the national assets that we have uh, very, very intelligently. Uh, let, me, let me just point out to you two broad realities of this ocean and the ocean space. The first thing, of course, is that uh, in our own aspirations for growth as a nation and our own aspirations for development uh, internally, uh, maritime security uh, is indeed one of the most important pillars, and that has been said in all forms and in all forums of our international engagement. And therefore, we need to pay a lot more heed to maritime security than we do at the moment. Uh, the second thing, of course, is that uh, uh, India's security uh, does not depend entirely only on India looking after its own security. Uh, but also uh, looking after the security of the neighbourhood. And uh, indeed it's been, uh, it's been articulated in our own foreign, foreign policy objectives uh, that one of the foremost interests that we have uh, is to maintain some kind of a, a tranquil neighbourhood, uh, a neighbourhood that is conducive uh, to our own internal growth and development. And therefore I think our own security is very deeply tied and intertwined with the security in the Indian Ocean region which makes it very, more, very, very much more important for us uh, as a big country uh, to also try and be security providers and protect uh, the global commons or the public good that is called. How does the Indian Navy help uh, in maintaining one, maritime security and two, uh, in guaranteeing some form of, of, of uh, protection of the public goods uh, in the Indian Ocean region? Uh, like the Vice Chief of Naval Staff said last, uh, last morning, we deploy extensively, we deploy very credible capability uh, extensively uh, in various places uh, of the world. Uh, we maintain presence almost constantly in all places that are important. Uh, much has been said about choke points, choke point security, uh, trade security, energy security, the security of sea lanes of communication and all that is very, very important. And, and for people who, who watch and monitor these kind of things, uh, you can never undermine the importance of naval platforms being present where it matters. And the Indian Navy invests a lot of effort uh, to make itself present uh, in all places that matter all around the world. 
and you do that, uh, you know, 24 by 7 or 365 days a year. Uh, it might also interest you that uh, in the recent, um, uh, you know, minor standoff that all of us saw in the Persian Gulf uh, or the uh, Iranian Gulf, uh, as the case may be, uh, we sent a ship immediately, a couple of ships that were already there, we just had to divert them uh, to go to the Gulf uh, in, in what we call Operation Sankar. And we had two very, very capable platforms uh, present, uh, just as a sign of reassurance to the Indian trade, Indian merchantmen, and not just the Indian trade and Indian mer merchantmen, but anybody who cared to be protected by us. So just our presence was a symbol of national intent, uh, and it matters, like Ambassador Raghavan Bhara this morning, uh, national intent uh, and national statement uh, in international waters to be there and help protect whoever needs to be protected. Uh, we've been doing something called capability building and capacity enhancement of smaller navies uh, for years, uh, in whatever form we could, um, sometimes giving them platforms, sometimes giving them technology, sometimes giving them spare support, uh, largely giving them training support and uh, you know, uh, it might interest you to know that uh, among all the navies of the Indian Ocean region, ours perhaps is uh, one of the navies that, that uh, gives very, very good training uh, and we are very renowned uh, everywhere in the world for the quality of training, for the quality of training establishments uh, and for the quality of interactions uh, and growth that we ensure in our training establishments for all students. Uh, we've also installed a lot of coastal radar systems in, in many of the small countries that don't have the ability of deploying radars themselves. We maintain those radar systems, we help them develop what we call maritime domain awareness. And if you just saw the slide that Admiral Shikande was uh, kind to just show just now, uh, the sea is a very, very busy space. Uh, there are thousands, hundreds and thousands of, of craft of all kinds, uh, of all descriptions that fly over the seas. Uh, and it's very, very important for all of, all of us to know who is good, who is not good, who's the good guy there and who's the bad guy. And, and broadly, you know, all of that is called maritime domain awareness. Uh, it's a very, very tough thing to do. Uh, it requires a lot of resources. It, it requires a lot of uh, presence. It requires a lot of technology. And there are a lot of nations in the Indian Ocean region that cannot uh, develop their own uh, MDA capabilities and we lend it to them. Uh, we share with them what we call white shipping information, uh, information of, of tracking all the ships that we do. Uh, I tell them where the ships are, where their ships are, and uh, if indeed uh, any of their ships are very close to any kind of danger, then we not only alert them, but also uh, make sure we are present there uh, to help them. International engagement is one of the big things that we do, and you know, um, uh, our cooperation in, for, in, in fighting common threats, uh, whether piracy is a traditional or non-traditional one, uh, is a discussion that we can go into, but piracy is a, a problem uh, in the Gulf of Aden, uh, in the state of Malacca, and everywhere else. Uh, and so uh, we make, make sure that uh, you know, we, we actively engage with other navies uh, to, to provide some kind of protection against piracy, against smuggling, against, uh, against drug running, against illegal immigration. The whole lot of other uh, what we call uh, is um, non-traditional threats. Uh, we are a big advocate of the Sagar. You know, wherever we go, we, we are the nation's ambassador and uh, we believe that uh, you know, if security and growth are two different arms, uh, then it's navies that actually fuse those two arms together. Uh, we provide security and therefore we enable growth as well. Uh, and so we think we are a big advocate of, of, of the whole concept of Sagar, uh, exactly like the Vice Chief of Naval Staff said yesterday. We carry out coordinated patrols uh, with Indonesia, with Thailand, with Myanmar, and uh, from recently with, with Bangladesh as well. Uh, and that's very important because, you know, uh, while they face the threats that they do, uh, they don't have the wherewithal to, to patrol, uh, you know, their own waters. And we do joint patrols with them, and we have multiple spin-offs positively because of that. Uh, we enhance what we call interoperability. Uh, we, we, we do a lot of uh, joint operations. We get to know how they operate, uh, and also we help them uh, sort out our security problems. Let's not forget, uh, even for a moment, uh, that because you know this, this part of the world continues to remain, to a large extent, very, very globalized. Uh, and therefore, if there's a problem in one part of the ocean, uh, it's only if, it, it won't be too long before the problem manifests itself on your shores. And uh, one of the philosophies of all navies, and certainly of the Indian Navy, uh, it is to, to make sure that if there are problems, the problems are contained a little away from the Indian shores. And that's why these, these presence missions are very, very important. Uh, we carry a joint EEZ patrols. Uh, the economic, um, ex exclusive economic zones of all countries are very, very important uh, to the economic growth and development. Uh, they have all kinds of uh, nat natural resources that lie in the e excluded economic zone and sometimes because you know people go and explore them uh, in an illegal fashion uh, it becomes important for nations to go and protect their own excluded economic zones and uh, like the Vice Chief of Naval Staff said yesterday a small country like Mauritius has a huge 
or exclusive economic zone that is, that is actually even larger than India's. But a country like Mauritius can ill afford to have its presence everywhere and protect its own exclusive economic zone. And therefore, as a larger and a responsible neighbor, uh, we take it upon ourselves uh, to provide them some assistance in doing ease and controls. Uh, that we do with Mauritius, we do with Seychelles, and uh, with Maldives as well. We are the champions of an organization called the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium. And uh, as it was mentioned yesterday, uh, it's, it's, it's a formulation of 32 navies, 24 of which are the IOR navies and 8 are observers. Uh, we championed that and we found that as uh, another means of, of uh, engaging with uh, uh, nations or like-minded nations. Uh, and certainly we see that as an avenue where uh, uh, we, can, we can understand each other better, understand the problems that we have better, evolve you know, common solutions uh, to common problems in the region. Uh, we champion that and uh, you'll be interested to know that um, just a couple of months back we celebrated the 10th anniversary and uh, uh, in Cochin it was a very big event and we once again reiterated that uh, our leadership role uh, as a big navy uh, to, to involve ourselves very actively and perhaps even lead the efforts of the islands. We carry out a lot of bilateral and multilateral exercises and uh, these are almost annual features uh, for us. Uh, we exercise with almost all navies of worth in the, navy, in the world, the biggest to the smallest. Uh, we have multilateral exercises and, you know, uh, uh, as, 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 as students of, of uh, strategic histories, as students of uh, strategic matters, uh, none of us can undermine uh, the importance uh, of confidence building among nations. And uh, we'd like to believe that uh, of all the measures that we take to build confidence among nations, military exercises are perhaps some of the more important ones. And, uh, and therefore, we, we do this uh, year on year. We invest considerable effort, considerable uh, resources uh, to do this, and we find them uh, very, very useful. Humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, uh, much has been said about it. Uh, but I think uh, it's, it's important to remind ourselves that, you know, in almost all cases of natural disaster uh, and calamities in the Indian Ocean region, uh, we have been the first responders. Uh, we have been the first guys to reach, uh, you know, uh, you, you would be interested to know that uh, every single Indian naval ship uh, that is deployed away from Indian shores carries with it what we call an HADR brick. Uh, it's a brick that has immediate relief material with it. Uh, and because we have ships pre-positioned in various parts of the Indian Ocean region, uh, if should disaster strike somewhere, uh, it's not very difficult to just divert the ship there. And uh, you know, uh, many times we've been the first responders, uh, and you know, all of you would know that. Uh, however small the first response is, uh, it's very, very important. Uh, it's very important for people because they are real people in the world who are struck with real disasters. And uh, if an Indian ship flying an Indian flag should just arrive there uh, soon after the disaster strikes, uh, it makes a huge, it makes a huge difference in our own international engagement efforts. Um, we had one uh, in Sulawesi, you know that in Indonesia in, in October 2018, uh, as uh, luck would have it or as things would have it, uh, we had a few ships in the vicinity and we just diverted them. The, the earthquake struck on the 3rd of October and the 5th of, 5th of October we were already poised. And on the 6th of October we, you know, we were there to, to provide a lot of help. Uh, let's not also forget that you know, many times when natural disasters strike, the normal connectivity to all these places get cut, gets cut simply because of you know, the upheaval of the land and things like that. And mostly uh, you get access only through the sea. So you need to have some you know, highly capable platform that can go there with helicopters, uh, you, know, uh, you know, set things in order, uh, reconstruct the roads, restore electrical supply, and, and the rest of it. And we do that. We do that very well. Uh, we also had one uh, of Mozambique very recently in the March of this year. And once again, the Indian Navy was the first responder. We, we just not went there. We had to uh, evacuate about 200 people, uh, you know, give supplies to about 14, 15,000 people. Uh, help in aerial reconnaissance. The local, the local administration had no idea of the devastation uh, of the natural calamity, so we had to embark the local administration on helicopters, fly them around, uh, show them what was happening there, uh, make them point out to us which were the pill, uh, pinch points and pressure points, and reach aid out there. And I think uh, you know none of us can undermine the importance of of those people you know who are, who are shell shocked by the natural calamity, seeing an Indian helicopter or an Indian navy guy going there. You know, with just a, 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 a packet of food, uh, it matters a lot. They've done a lot in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh as well. Uh, the roles of the Navy, you know, doctrinally and structurally, uh, we've defined them as four. Uh, one is military, which, is, uh, which has to do with the combat operations. 
Uh, and we do a lot of that. Um, you know, uh, your Navy is a very strong Navy. Uh, we pack a lot of uh, combat capabilities and we keep exercising uh, with them a lot. Uh, but if you talk of the other three uh, roles that we have defined for ourselves, uh, one is a benign role, which includes HADR and the rest of it. Uh, one is a constabulary role, which, which includes the policing, the enforcement of law and order, ensuring good order and discipline at sea. And one is a diplomatic role, which is uh, you know, lending ourselves and our efforts uh, to strengthening our foreign policy initiatives. Uh, so if, of the four roles, if you see, uh, apart from the military role, which is the combat role, the benign role, the constabulary role, and the diplomatic role, answer exactly to, to the topic for today's discussion, which is, you know, how are we providing security in the Indian Ocean region uh, and ensuring the availability of public goods uh, to everybody. Uh, so we do that. Um, and therefore, we'd like to believe that uh, in the 21st century, like, uh, like before, uh, the Indian Navy uh, is a very important and credible instrument of national policy uh, and national security, not just for us, but others in the region as well. And the role, uh, you know, navies have always been important and navies have always uh, packed with them a range of capabilities, uh, but we know very well that uh, uh, with, the, with the strategic conditions uh, in, the, in the Indian Ocean region in the 21st century, uh, the role of navies is only going to increase, and uh, the role and relevance and the criticality of the Indian Navy in this region is only going to increase in terms of its ability to provide security, in terms of its ability to assure the availability of public goods, uh, in, in, in terms of its ability to to protect our own national interests and further our own national aspirations. So to conclude, let me just round up with, with three broad thoughts um, which you might like to take note of. The first thing is that, um, you know, providing net security or security in the region for us uh, is actually driven by three different factors. The first factor, of course, is the need. And like I said, we need to ensure that there is, there is security in our neighborhood. You know, uh, it, we, we're not doing it for, for, for uh, you know, uh, for generosity. We are doing it because it helps our national interests. So uh, we need to understand that the investment we make uh, in our neighborhood uh, is because of our own need. Uh, our ability to, to, um, to ensure net security in the region is also driven by our own policy and our own willingness politically. You know, we make statements like Sagar, we say neighborhood first. Um, as a political establishment, you know, we are, we are willing uh, to look at the neighborhood and invest time, effort and money there. Uh, to make sure that we make them, uh, you know, we, we enhance the general sense of well-being. Our national ethos, you know, traditionally has been on multilateralism, on finding, you know, cooperative and collaborative solutions to common problems. Uh, and that, again, is one of the drivers, you know, if there's a problem somewhere, uh, we like to go and uh, engage with people, we, we don't like to be threatening, um, at the same time we like to be useful, so we like to go and, in a very collaborative, kind of benign, uh, benign way, uh, follow the national ethos and you know, go and ensure that uh, there is some kind of security in all areas of the Indian Ocean, uh, Indian Ocean region uh, that matter to us. My second point is, uh, you know, in the 21st century when we talk of India's growth, India's rise, India's emergence, uh, what do we talk about uh, India? Uh, Indian aspirations, Indian national interests, uh, for us to fulfill all of that, you know, we need two or three big things to be ensured. One is connectivity globally. Uh, we need to be seen all over the world. Uh, one, we need to have the capability and capacity uh, which we can deploy all over the world. And the third is we need to have credibility. Uh, if you don't have, uh, you know, if you're not able to connect, uh, if you're not capable, if you don't establish your credibility, then none of your aspirations or national interests can actually see fulfillment. Uh, and I think the Indian Navy, uh, in a way, contributes uh, to our connectivity, uh, to our capabilities, uh, and to our credibility all over the world. And the last point, of course, is. Um, we talked we talk about the trust deficit uh, that the neighborhood has on India because, you know, we talk a lot, uh, but when it comes to delivery, we haven't been uh, as good as we'd like to. Uh, I'd like to point out that uh, uh, in terms of delivery in the neighborhood, uh, it is the Indian Navy that has the most credibility because we talk of providing security and we are there. And therefore, I think uh, it's important for all of us to recognize that the Indian Navy is not only uh, an instrument of national policy and security, but it's also a good ambassador of what the nation can do in this neighborhood. Thank you very much. Uh, we had uh, three um, uh, excellent presentations, um, two from the Navy officers, one from a distinguished academic from the strategic studies. And uh, the whole discourse in one way or other way revolves around connectivity. 
I am from the northeastern part of India, though I was born and brought up in Chennai. I've been residing in northeast for the past more than three decades. In most of the events which we have, either in Delhi or in northeast, the word, the buzzword is connectivity, connectivity, connectivity. In fact, I used to tell in, in some of the events, we have talked enough on connectivity. There's a lot of things we have done on physical connectivity, transport connectivity, trade connectivity. But now in this particular scene, in the first presentation, uh, Dr. Chandran has brought up our cultural connectivity, how it, it connects uh, people as well as the countries in the Indian Ocean and in the South and Southeast Asia and East Asia. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, he also mentioned about how our policy, our look is, now it has upgraded into active policy. Now he was suggesting about bringing ease. That's a very uh, beautiful idea of bringing some more synergy in our, in our uh, foreign policy thinking as well as in our dialogue with our neighboring countries. Now, uh, as we have heard these three presentations, now it is open for discussion. We have about half an hour time, sir. Or 45 minutes? Uh, 12 minutes. 12 minutes, okay. <laughs> uh, we'll have a short uh, discussion of uh, 12 to 15 minutes. We'll give first the uh, choices for the students uh, who are sitting behind. And we'll have two or three questions from the students, and then we'll come to the front row for the uh, senior uh, academics as well as the officials. So my question is to Dr. Subhash. Uh, hello sir, I'm Benita. I'm working for TAC Economics. So my question is when you brought down how traditions should be pushed down from Delhi to all the other parts of India, uh, don't you think that tradition and uh, migration overlaps? For, some, for example, if that is the case, uh, in South India, to be specific, in Chennai itself, when the uh, population from North India or Northeast come for work, um, I don't think so people in Chennai are still not accepting them as a part of the culture in India. So, what do you, uh, oh, oh, your comments on that, please? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My question is to uh, Dr. Subha sir. Um, myself, Gargi, and I'm a publishing manager in Notion Press. And uh, just uh, just a small query uh, regarding your comment on India as a co um, cultural contributor. So my question to you is, sir, uh, what do you think uh, would be the major contribution culturally uh, from India's side to uh, the Southeast and South Asian region? And I just personally want to know, like, uh, what would be your uh, idea behind, you know, the pop culture that we are de de uh, developing, like, you know, recently in the contemporary situation? How it is going to be uh, helpful uh, in unifying all these nations, Southeast Asia and South Asian region? Thank you. Uh, I just have a quick um, suggestion, no question, to to Admiral uh, Swaminathan. A lot of such guru measures that uh, Indian Navy undertakes, I, I think it needs to be marketed adequately to create a you know, favorable uh, you know, perception towards Indian activities and involvement. And uh, more so, you know, schools and colleges, that's one part of it, the domestic constituency, but at the international level also, at the, at the international level also, we must market it heavily that it is visible, it is uh, talked about, people are aware of it. Uh, I think that could be a good tool too. Thank you. Excuse me. Sorry, I had two questions. Uh, one to the first speaker and the other to the other two speakers. Um, yes. Since in fact you placed stress on cultural connectivity or cultural engagement, especially on the part of India, with Southeast Asia as well as West Asia. What do you think has been the major impediment to this reaching out? Um, here, for instance, for almost uh, 50 years since independence, 
We've had uh, the ICCR operating at different levels in order to, to, to create such engagements. We have new technologies which permit us to do so. Uh, but we do not seem to be getting very much further than the uh, stage of the mid-20th century. So this is my first question to you. Uh, the second question to the other two speakers is this, which is that both your presentations seem to indicate a certain uh, sense of agreement on how to treat the global commons uh, and the fact that India contributes to that overall sense of a common agreed path of cooperation in the global commons. It essentially means the Indian Ocean as well as the, the Arabian Sea, Bay of Bengal area. Uh, the South China Sea uh, problem indicated a disagreement uh, concerning how to treat commons. Uh, the, my question to you is, in fact, how far do you think such disagreements could occur in future as resources become increasingly a subject of competition within this particular region? And how far has India been aware, especially from the naval dimension, of how to treat such competition when it arises? Thank you. We know that they have been trying to develop an alternative uh, route towards the west and then going through the Indian Ocean. So does this mean that they would be weaning away from the Indian Ocean area? Their, especially their oil traffic and what would be the impact on security, number one. Second one is uh, many of the topics which you said about slogs and various other aspects. I didn't hear you mentioning anything about uh, the resources in the ocean bed. A lot of research is going on in uh, ocean mining, in hydrate, experiments and the seabed authority also has given uh, different countries or the members different places for the R&D. China is doing pretty well, so it's uh, South Korea, Japan, etc. Uh, we are also there, uh, but we are doing something a little less uh, adventurous. So could you comment about what is the security scene on this, but this resources will come into commercial play maybe in another 15 years time. Could you comment about that? Thank you. Uh, my friend uh, Subhash Hidran uh, you know, raised uh, certain questions about how the Navy tries to identify itself as a net security provider. You know, and I think perhaps it's a valid question, not in terms of the ability of the Navy itself, but more in terms of how the Navy wants to showcase itself along with its neighbor. If you call it yourself perhaps a net security facilitator or net security enabler, then it would be received better. I don't know. Uh, it's just a thought. Uh, because I think there is uh, a certain amount of reluctance from the neighbors to accept you as as, as a lead guy who will take care of their events, etc. So it's a question of how we sell your product. It's a thought, good thought for consideration. Other point is about the four roles that I identified, or the traditional roles of the Navy, uh, you know, include the, uh, the role of the Coast Guard. The Navy consciously created the Coast Guard and has uh, outsourced this to the Coast Guard. And uh, it's a good thing that Navy is also carrying these HADR kits, as you mentioned. But should not the Coast Guard be more in the front of the HADR etc. Though I understand the number of games is always challenging. So maybe I think the Coast Guard uh, should take on a lot more than what it's doing now, uh, despite the challenges and numbers. Uh, this is Dr. Uh, Dr. So you talk about reinventing stories of both Gaya and Arjuna and Sophie being the narrative of Southeast. But sir, we already have a growing intolerance in our country with the Jai Sri Ram Lights and the Moglin Shape. How do you think we can curtail this? In order to bring the economic community to our nation, and we in fact are like being intolerant towards them. Thank you. The point I was trying to make is, uh, uh, you know, when I said look beyond New Delhi, it's not that we have to push the culture from Delhi to the other, other part. What I was trying to say is there is enough culture from uh, from Shillong to. Uh, Chennai in, uh, and then we have seen it over the years, centuries, these regions pushing themselves uh, in, in their own cultural circles with, uh, with our neighbourhood. You know, as, as they would say, from where he is coming from, uh, Shillong, uh, maybe Bangkok at the flow flies is closer to Delhi, closer than uh, Delhi. So that's the point I was, uh, I was trying to make, not in terms of pushing what's there in Delhi to, to other regions, to promote what already is existing. 
the interesting question that uh, one of you asked is about the POF. Uh, this is uh, something that's, uh, that we have to look beyond that uh, India has a <coughs> cultural, uh, you know, pushing our culture into, uh, into Southeast Asia. I think we should also be open to see uh, their culture into uh, ours. Uh, the point that you made is, is well taken. Uh, that, for example, the Korean POF. Uh, my mother watches uh, the Korean uh, TV serials in Tamil, uh, thanks to one of the uh, TV channels, you know, uh, translating and anime. My son watches Korean and Japanese cartoons. Uh, so you know there is a you know there is a it's also coming from from the other side. But then we can move beyond it. I was talking to you about the two actors, the Michelle and uh, uh, Saputra. There are there are other actors, other movies. But unfortunately, we just play them as Chinese movies. You know, or or the Pussy. You know, everything for us is fried rice is just a Chinese food, rice. You know, I was talking about the whole curry. I I, I could go down the list. There is this sambal. Uh, there is the satay uh, and the Malaysian upper, you know, the moment we go and uh, see the, uh, the dosa there or uh, oh, this is what we make in, uh, in Kerala. So that, that kind of feels, you know, the, 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 the South Asian cuisine is just not Chinese cuisine. You know, it's like somebody in North India calling the ancient manches in you know. When you come, the sambar is different in, in Bangalore and in, in Chennai. Uh, you know, when we have that sentiment, the Tao Sambar is different from the Northern Sambar. I think we should also respect that. You know, that's what we have to go beyond. And instead of we going there, I think we should we should also be able to receive uh, uh, the the multiple things, uh, the pop, the cartoon, and then and then what? You know, that's one. Uh, the second point is you know the impediment oh, part. Uh, the impediment part that uh, you you the impediment part that uh, you asked. Uh, you know, I'll give an example of uh, two towns that I visited uh, some 10, 12 years before uh, Jabin was uh, kind enough to take me to Chengdu for one of his projects. And uh, we, I don't know whether you remember, uh, we went to Chengdu University, this 12 years before. And in Chengdu University, I was surprised to see the history of Sri Lanka in Chinese. Uh, and then the history of Northeast in, in Chinese language. Another university, Heidelberg, uh, you know, uh, I, I was in the Hanenberg University, I was happy to see Kumudam and Ananda Vigden from day one, 1960s. My father used to take 20 pies and, and so I took a photo and said, this is in you know, Hanenberg, Chengdu, they are not mainstream places, these are regional places. The investment that they have made on, on these areas is, I think we should look at a similar investment about, you know, if we are talking about cultural investment, I think we have to make a similar investment about Southeast Asia, not in Delhi, not in JNU, in other places. We are doing it, but then, for example, we may have an area center, a Vietnam center in Tripathi, but we may not be able to fill the faculty position. You know, you, you know, structurally you make institutions, you don't fill up. Uh, this is what you know, the difference between uh, the, Sri Lanka, the Sri Lankan history in Chinese in Chengdu and, uh, and our own uh, area centers where even we don't have faculty. The, the biggest impediment is this, we, we create, we have ideas, uh, we don't follow up, you know, the, the same discussion that uh, uh, we had in the morning. I think I kind of, the growing intolerance, uh, it's just a cycle, don't, uh, you know, the, 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 the how we treat, uh, uh, you know, the non, the outsiders, insiders, you know, don't, don't uh, spend too much on, too much on it. It just happens for a month or two weeks, and then in the next year you look at the, the, the example that you, you, one of you talked about Northeast students in, in Bangalore and Chennai three years before. This year there are more students than the last few years. So let's not just look at only one aspect and then see that's us. There's a larger us, there's a better us also in, in us. Thank you. Uh, we have we have discussed uh, the capabilities and limitations of several instruments of state power, the diplomatic, informational, military, economic, the time, time construct. And I, I would like to offer a slightly different view of the cultural aspect of soft power, which has been discussed a lot yesterday and today. I'm, I, I agree that it's not a binary thing you need. You need a whole lot of instruments, a whole uh, you know, uh, toolkit uh, of, of uh, uh, our efforts. But I would like to offer some cautions on cultural diplomacy or you know, even cultural uh, imposition or cultural suggestions. Uh, we, we discussed Indonesia. I have interacted with Indonesians 
uh, in my official capacity, in my personal capacity, in the social capacity. About the, the worst thing you can tell Indonesians is, is to say that, oh, your names are so Sanskrit, you know, despite despite you know Islam having been there or you know uh, Islam came from India etc. I think mean, these are some of the some of the things we actually ought not to say at all or not to imply also. Whatever has happened, the past you know does not matter uh, all that much. Yeah, apart from that, we, we don't ourselves realize that much of this influence was backed up by military hard power uh, and, and a lot of statecraft uh, centuries ago. So uh, you know this, this awareness is deeper in those areas. Likewise, in Cambodia, in Thailand, uh, you know, it, it's not helpful to tell them, oh, your king has the same name as, as our kings uh, used to have. It's, it's just not helpful. Uh, likewise, there are, you know, I won't, I won't uh, uh, go into that, but likewise, we also take offense when somebody tells us, the British come and tell us you're more English than us. That's, that's not a compliment. Uh, uh, yeah. So there are there are several aspects of this sort. What Admiral Kanan asked, um, uh, yes, sir, I mean uh, you're, you're right. Uh, I just didn't have the time to go into various changes and uh, uh, dangers that are happening in terms of the seabed mining. Certainly, it will be an area, and again, uh, the same kind of competition uh, with with technological capabilities, uh, etc., for deep sea mining in the on the high seas where it is still an open field. Uh, there are certain areas which are which are given, but again, I suppose eventually uh, the nation which has more technological capabilities to exploit these uh, and develops cost-effective methods, of which again, uh, you know, uh, our 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 companies and I hope uh, LNT is also doing, uh, you know, engineering capabilities to, uh, to you know be a leader in deep sea mining. So that is one. The Arctic, uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, the, the ocean routes to much of Europe and North America will be will be much more efficient uh, uh, navigationally eventually uh, than than the ones through uh, the Indian Ocean region. But the importance of Indian Ocean region will of course remain. And yet, uh, the, the sort of even in a even in a high intensity conflict, uh, the percentage of trade that can be choked uh, by by navies, you know. Acting against China, or China acting against against India or the United States, uh, that that percentage that can be choked with the resources available is 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 probably going to be lesser than the percentage that comes on rails, uh, pipelines, and roads. So whereas the cost of these is is much higher, the strategic importance of alternatives remains. And the other thing I would like to suggest here is that we hear the term Malacca dilemma, but actually. Uh, Chinese leadership implied it as a vulnerability, which is different from the dilemma, from a dilemma. So Malaccas remain a vulnerability, and they are doing a lot to plug those vulnerabilities. Places and bases, they have issues, but but you know it could it could uh, it could change over time. The what Commodore Vasan sir, what you were uh, uh, mentioning, I I think uh, probably in the political system itself, which first started using the term. Yes, sir, as you said. And this is really a, a, a problem. Uh, two things that uh, you know, all naval guys, uh, at least of the Indian Navy, keep saying, of course, is that um, one, the, the Navy is a silent service. We do much of our work beyond the horizon, so nobody really sees us working. So we need to come and advertise ourselves, otherwise, you know, people don't even get to know what we do. And uh, if we'd like to believe that we do some important work, we need to come and talk about it. Um, so uh, the second thing that has been, you know, lamented for a long time uh, about our own culture in our country is is what we call sea, sea blindedness. So we have been sea blind as a nation for a, for, for a very long time and because ours is a silent service, it doesn't help us too much that we, are, we haven't been able to uh, show to our own population a lot of what, what we do. But the good news of course is that uh, much of that is changing and uh, uh, over the last 10, 15, 20 years uh, we've, uh, you know, we've taken the page to come and uh, communicate a lot more to our own uh, policy makers, our decision makers uh, and of course you know it very well that uh, uh, in most bilateral agreements that have been signed in the last five or six years, maritime security figures very, very high. And it figures very high simply because the government knows intrinsically that the Navy can deliver. And so there is a recognition uh, in the in the highest levels of the government, and Admiral uh, Shekhar Sinha would, would know a lot more than I do. Uh, there's a recognition uh, that we can do that. Um, the, our, the other constituency that we know is the other navies. 
So for the people who watch these kind of things and watch what happens at sea, uh, a lot of other navies know what we do and what we bring to the table. So uh, even without advertising to them directly through uh, other means, uh, we advertise through the nations, through the navies, uh, about what we do. I think that's where we get some visibility. But you're absolutely right, we need to uh, do a lot, a lot more there and we can do that. Um, the second about the contestation of the sea, sir, and about the freedom of navigation. Um, this has found uh, a pronouncement in many of your, many of our, uh, the Prime Minister's speeches uh, and other speeches as well on how we, uh, you know, uh, try and support uh, an order-based uh, international uh, international order and how we support freedom of navigation and things like that. So obviously, uh, 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 civilizationally and culturally, we are people who who like to say that you know let 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 us play by the rules and anybody who doesn't play by the rules uh, needs needs to get shamed uh, and and named and shamed. Uh, quite like what uh, Professor Kanti Bajpai said that, you know, uh, there is a lot to be said about uh, being a good boy, uh, you know, if you want to be a big boy uh, in international in the international order. Uh, the third thing about, of course, the, it's a very, very uh, important semantic difference between being a provider and uh, being an enabler or facilitator. And administration, they said it uh, absolutely rightly. Uh, we, uh, the good news, of course, is that here as well, uh, there's a big dialogue within the Navy. We put out a documentation a few years back and uh, we kept wondering whether uh, one of course, uh, if you say you're a provider, would you always be able to guarantee that you would provide? And we don't because, you know, many times we are constrained by our own capacities, our own capabilities and things like that. So there is no guarantee, but we'd like to be there. Um, and of course, we need to keep in mind the sensitivities of people who receive, uh, you know, that kind of security. So we don't want to say that we're providing you the, the security. Um, so this is, this is absolutely right. It's an important semantic difference. Uh, within the Navy itself, uh, hopefully when the next set of documentation is put out, you will probably see it uh, being called a net security enabler or something of that kind. Thank you. Uh, let me express my deep sense of gratitude for the three panelists. They have given an excellent presentation from three different dimensions. And uh, Dr. Um, Admiral Swaminathan has summed up very neatly, very lucidly, saying that we need to have connectivity, capability and credibility uh, as I said, in the northeastern uh, part of India, we lack connectivity. Uh, connectivity in physical side as well as in the emotional connectivity and in the cultural connectivity. Northeast India is a diverse, colorful region. And uh, as I have been traveling to different places in, our, in India, a couple of years ago I was in Bombay University for a lecture. And many of them, they were not aware what North is and what people of the North is are concerned. First of all, we need to have our own connectivity within the country, within the region, and then we have to think about the maritime connectivity and also the continental connectivity, which is part and part of our Actis policy, our Lukis policy, or what our friend Chandran uh, has said about uh, 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 yeast, inviting yeast. Now, I want to just summarize one small thing which I read in economics magazine some years ago, not some years ago, some months ago. They have said that the current GDP of the United States is under $17 trillion and China below $7 trillion. India is about $2 trillion which is aiming for $5 trillion. And uh, the projected estimate in 2030 the lineup would be as follows. The lineup would be China $25.6 trillion and United States $22.8 trillion. India is expected $6.68 trillion. In comparison, the GDP of other major global economies in 2030 are uh, estimated to be as follows. Japan. 5.88 trillion dollars, Germany 3.76, United Kingdom 3.59, France 3.3, Italy 2.39. This would mean that the three major powers in Asia in 2030 will be China, India and Japan. It is said Asia is voiced to be the center of world trade and politics, so much so the 21st century is called Asian century. Thus the lifeline of this growth is the Indian Ocean. Therefore Indian Ocean need to be an ocean of peace and tranquility, 
a notion of growth and prosperity. With that, let me close the session. My sincere thanks to um, uh, Air Marshal Mathiswar for giving me this great privilege to chat the session. Thank you very much.